Thank you. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. This is my, my first time uh, to South Africa. And uh, I also have the pleasure of celebrating my 60th birthday uh, while I will be here at the conference uh, tomorrow. Uh, so it's so a bit of a special uh, uh, time for me. And my wife and I have had a great time traveling uh, uh, and, and learning so much more about South Africa. Um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, IoT and sort of introduce you to it. I'm also doing a workshop tomorrow. Uh, hopefully many of you will be uh, attending that. I'll be diving much deeper into some things, particularly digital supply chain. Uh, but uh, past board member of the Supply Chain Council as well as Apex, I also represent Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's uh, Supply Chain Management Program and Engineering Schools to the Industrial Internet Consortium, the leading industry trade association uh, for supply chain management best practices and IoT. Uh, so what I'd like to talk to you about Internet of Things and try to make it you know, so that it really resonates with supply chain professionals. Uh, and we're used to standing up our, our corporate and customer information systems, ER, ERP, CRM, uh, to track our procurement processes, our inventories, and such like that. But at the end of the day, this does leave us with a data disconnect around our assets that we have either in our manufacturing facilities or actually at our customer sites. And so the challenge is, is how do we get data off of uh, our equipment that is out in the field installed at customer sites? Maybe we produce manufacturing equipment that other companies use or a component that uh, another OEM incorporates into their product. Uh, and so the promise of IoT is to figure out and enable us to be able to get that data so that we can improve the performance and operation of the equipment and at the same time improve uh, the supply chain. Um, and if we think about what is IoT, well, it's about information technology in a physical device that enables remote monitoring and management of the asset. And there's sort of two types. I'm gonna talk about the first one, which is passive monitoring. This is about data telemetry. We're going to basically monitor the state of the asset with various sensors. Uh, we're going to communicate, upload that state, the data, uh, to other systems so that we know what is the, the status of that device. Uh, and there's no real capability for that device to receive commands, but there may be some limited business logic uh, that uh, it is doing that maybe sends out an alert based on something. Then we also have active management IoT devices. This is about command and control. And so here we have a device that can actually receive uh, commands and control instructions from other systems. Uh, it may also uh, operate and perform controls on other devices that it may operate out in the field like as a mesh or a network of, of devices. And quite often we have very advanced business logic in this case to execute rules based on the state or the condition of the sensors it's monitoring. And you have bi-directional data and command instructions over various networks. And so fundamentally the key things to think about is that IoT systems require sensors, uh, devices, secure connections up to the cloud and an application at, at a base minimum. So let's take a look at what one of these systems looks like. Okay, so first of all, we have say an array of say temperature sensors that are going to report out what is the temperature uh, of something. Uh, and these are going to send the data in a secure fashion through authenticated communications up to the cloud. Uh, and then we'll have maybe applications in the cloud that if the sensors agree that the temperature is above a certain threshold, then we want to send out instructions uh, to turn on the fan. So the first half of what I just discussed, uh, steps one and two, that's a passive type scenario. But now we're not starting to turn into an active one. And so now the fan is going to receive instructions down from the cloud communications that says, uh, and we're going to talk in a, in a secure fashion to uh, tell that fan uh, to actually turn on. 
Uh, and then we may also have, say, maybe mobile devices that uh, can also be used to, in this scenario, to control and maybe set configurations, maybe change the temperature at which the fan will turn on. Now, this can be very useful. Uh, when Microsoft actually got around to here a couple years ago, actually IoT enabling their entire campus in Redmond, Washington, uh, they uh, uh, started receiving data streams from about 30,000 devices. And they actually found that they actually had some ventilation fans in some of their buildings that had been running 24-7, 365 days a year for the last 20 years because no one had ever set the temperature threshold manually at locally at the device. And so once they wired it all up, they could then see this and then really achieve some substantial energy savings as a consequence. So basically we're trying to create value by making sense of data, by connecting the devices up, uh, connect, getting the data off of it so that we then have knowledge about what is the state of these things so that we can then take action. And this uh, enables some use cases, maybe be a smart home, smart city, uh, a smart car. Uh, these are the types of use cases we look to achieve. And basically, it's about enabling organizations to get to the real-time enterprise. And what this graph here is showing is that as we are trying to learn about how our enterprise is behaving, the sooner we learn about some business event, and the, and the sooner we can take and respond to that business event, the greater the value to the organization. So we want to be further up the, the, the graph here, but as time extends, uh, the value of that data event decreases. And so if maybe you're a retail operation, uh, you want to get information such as, you know, what are the sales that are happening, what are competitive price moves, uh, other at attributes of how you're monitoring uh, the ecosystem of your, of your uh, supply chain. And you have the business event, we get the information, uh, we then can take action upon it, and this enables us to then feed this information back up in and really be able to adjust and fine tune our inventories and such. So IoT is actually more than just the internet of things, it's really about the internet of everything. And that includes your existing PCs and tablets, uh, your smartphones, uh, uh, we also now are seeing connected cars, uh, wearables, you may have a fitness band or a Fitbit or something to that effect. You may have a connected TV. And then we also have this sort of spectrum in there of the uh, Internet of Things where we're now saying, hey, what else can we enable and uh, get data off of it? And currently we're at about 10 billion connected devices globally, uh, as we are here right now. Uh, and it's said that by about 2020, we'll be at around 50 billion devices. And uh, you'll see various projections out there that by 2025, we should be up to over 200 uh, billion IoT devices uh, out there. So you might think about, well, do you really know how many IoT devices you actually own and, or maybe use on a monthly basis in your own personal lives. So we can think about maybe you have none or maybe up to five, six to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 40, uh, or, or more than 40. Does anybody here think you have more than 40? Okay, w what about maybe at least 20? Okay. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to see, but I'm not seeing too many hands. Well, anyways, I, I, I went about doing a, an inventory uh, of my own uh, devices. Okay, uh, I've got uh, a Jawbone Bluetooth speaker. Uh, we've, I've got a cable TV box. I've got a cable modem. I've got an Xbox game system. I, I have a couple of health trackers. I have a home security monitoring system. Uh, I have a home theater. Uh, I have an internet protocol radio, an IP radio, uh, laptops. Uh, I have uh, some Miracast, Miracast and Chromecast devices. These are a plug-in you put into a, a dumb TV. Um, I have a network printers. Uh, I've got a router in my house. I've got a couple of them actually. I've got, a smart, I've got some smart TVs. 
smartphones, I've got some tablets, uh, I actually have a, a smart vehicle that's connected an Audi, and then I have an Easy Pass that records tolls uh, when I pass on, on uh, uh, toll roads. Uh, and then I've also got a, a VoIP phone, I use Skype. Okay, and when I did a total inventory, I actually came up to a total of 43 devices. And so I'd ask you to go back, and it took me actually about a week, because I kept thinking, oh gee, I forgot about that. Uh, go make a point of inventorying and knowing how many devices you actually have. Because at the end of the day, all of these are actually collecting data about you surveillance at the end of the day about your personal life and how you live it. And, and I'm, just by the way, I'm not including in this 43 credit cards and debit cards with, with chips in them. That, that's actually another device. Um, and I'm also not including all of the sensors that are attached to my home security system. If I did that, I'd have to add like another 30. Okay? And oh, by the way, this is just my wife and I. Uh, our kids are grown. And, and so this is just us. And so you probably have a lot more than you realize uh, today. So if we think about how is IoT happening, it has a lot to do with what sort of degree of digital mastery there are in various industries. And no surprise, in the high tech industry, uh, they're widely using it. Banking, I worked JP Morgan for almost a decade. An ATM is an IoT device at the end of the day. Uh, retail, uh, cash registers are, are IoT devices. Uh, your RFID scanners are another uh, are, uh, re, uh, IoT device. Uh, but it, you'll see down here in the lower left-hand quadrant, pharmaceuticals, consumer packaged goods, manufacturing, these industries have been slow to adopt digital technology, and this is real, where the real opportunity is for industrial IoT to start to enable uh, the uh, equipment and systems used in these industries, and this is where the real potential is. And there's been some adoption in the utility industry, but still on the low end. Telecoms is, uh, is up there uh, as a bigger adopter, uh, but uh, you will also, and this is, this is from a study that was done by some folks at Capgemini and MIT, this, this data that I'm showing here, a great book uh, that uh, uh, they've written. And what they found in looking across all these industries, even though there were certain industries, like as I said, pharmaceutical manufacturing, consumer packaged goods that were laggards in adoption of this, and you may think, okay, I've got time there were always still at least seven to 10% of the industry that were already starting to play around with this. And so if your company is not doing anything here, I assure you, you've got at least one competitor who is. And you risk being left behind if you don't start getting into the space. Um, so let's actually talk about IoT in, in Africa and like what are the capability, capacity and drivers for you to actually be able to go do this. Uh, and I started looking around and actually came across some interesting charts. I, f I found this one rather interesting. Um, it, you'll see here that uh, uh, Africa has got like about 18% as an entire continent in, in terms of internet penetration. You're actually ahead of, of the India, Southeast Asia uh, region. They're only at about 12%. So you're, you're not last, and, and you're actually catching up pretty good to other uh, major areas uh, such as Southeast Asia uh, there. Uh, so uh, definitely some capacity uh, to do this. As we then look at, uh, say, uh, uh, average connection speeds, uh, uh, you know, yes, South Korea is way up there. United Kingdom, you know, uh, at about 10 uh, gig megabits per second. Uh, South Africa at, at 33.6. Uh, you can't actually read the chart, but I actually went off and, and did some measurements using uh, some software and actually came up with some fairly similar numbers for South Africa. And I contrasted it to the US for, for actual upload speed, which is really what you really need for uh, IoT to upload the data. Uh, uh, the speed that I deal with upload in the U.S. is, is about five and a half gigabits per second. Uh, you're at about 3.6. So uh, not too bad in this regard, actually. Now, you may feel it's painful, say, trying to watch a YouTube video. With IoT, 
the amount of data that we're trying to upload is actually pretty small. We're just trying to say maybe put up a temperature sensor. That's not much data. Oh, you want to send a command instruction down to a device uh, to turn it on or control it. The data payload is small, so you don't need the massive bandwidth that, say, a South Korea has. Yes, that'll be great and we'll do more things, but you can still accomplish a great deal with your existing infrastructure. Um, and uh, this is actually a chart here from the Industrial Internet Consortium, uh, about 200 companies that are involved, you know, the Siemens, the Bosch's, the GE's, uh, and Cisco's, and Microsoft's, and IBM's, or, and Oracle uh, recently joined uh, this. Uh, and this was a chart of where they were looking at w what is the internet penetration, but the box in yellow uh, was actually looking at where these big companies think the opportunity for growth is. Uh, and South Africa was in here, Nigeria was, uh, was in, this, uh, is in this box. So the big players are absolutely looking at how can they work here. Uh, and then also, if you look at mobile phone growth, uh, over the last uh, five years going uh, from only about 100 million phones up to about 500 million uh, uh, phones across all of Africa. This is the real interface. You don't need a PC to control the device. Uh, I, I interface with a lot of my uh, IoT devices, my home security system, my uh, security monitoring system, all through my phone. Uh, the mobile phone is, is what you need. And as we look at, at smartphone penetration here in South Africa, you're already at 47%. This is critical mass. Uh, so your population, your consumers really do have the ability uh, to really start uh, engaging and uh, coming up strong are other countries like Nigeria uh, and Tanzania uh, in, in this space. And when we think about what is the driver here, well, we're estimating that by 2030, uh, IoT will add about $15 trillion to the worldwide economy uh, beyond that which it would have achieved without it. And the biggest percentage, 40% of it, is in the business manufacturing space, another 30% in healthcare, uh, and then lesser amounts uh, in transportation and, and retail and, and uh, consumer. Uh, so a lot of opportunity to drive the growth of your economy by focusing in this area. And here's a chart, uh, another analysis that the IIC did where we looked at uh, where was the, the growth potential uh, by various geographic regions. And Africa and Middle East uh, was, uh, is projected to grow uh, with, without IoT only about uh, half a trillion uh, dollars uh, by 2030. Uh, by uh, 2030, uh, the ability to add a potentially approaching a, uh, another uh, 500 billion on top of that, actually a trillion, a total of a trillion in economic growth. So this is the, the real potential here. Um, and you might think, well, well, why would the big US companies or European companies want to partner with companies here in, in South Africa. Well, if you look at the big internet assets, be it Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Yahoo, Wikipedia, you know, I, I go on down the line, Amazon, Apple, okay? Literally 80% of their customers are in fact global. Not only 20% is actually in the US. And so the big companies have to come here to understand how to engage and uh, build market and business with you. This is your opportunity to be able to specify and say how you want to engage with them uh, and, and drive it. Um, uh, so what are some of the objectives that you might like to achieve here? Well, first of all, it, it is about creating smart products, smart agriculture, smart factory, uh, smart transportation, smart cities. Uh, and all of these have a number of different, various different smart use, use cases that you can go after and pursue that have a lot of different opportunity uh, to go and enable within your business operations. Um, and uh, so if we dive into this a little bit more deeply, okay, 
if we think about the information flows in connected manufacturing and supply chain operations. So over here on, on the left, you'll see we've got our equipment with sensors and devices that we are going to say IoT enable. Uh, and this is going to capture granular data off of these and monitor the real-time performance of these various devices. And then we're going to put this up into uh, our cloud uh, so that we can uh, manage uh, these and then circle back and optimize the performance of the equipment and the process performance, doing real-time predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, some of the things that uh, 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 Laura was talking about here earlier this morning, if you were in her session. Great. Well, that's not the entire thing. This is, this is similar to the, the fan uh, 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 diagram I showed here a little bit earlier uh, in the session. But here's the real opportunity for, for supply chain. This data that we're putting up in the cloud now enables you to feed that to your design engineers to be able to do design optimization. You can also be looking at the data uh, to do supply chain collaboration with your vendors, your suppliers uh, that you're receiving goods from. And then it also is about enabling new business models, new service models uh, with your distribution channels uh, that you engage with. So there's a whole ring of other activities that uh, we can use this data to improve the productivity uh, and competitiveness of, of your business. So I'd also like you to think about, does the IoT enablement solve your needs or the customer's needs? because I've seen a number of IoT implementations where they say, okay, we have a product with capabilities, we're gonna add some new capabilities, we're gonna IoT enable it, and the business naturally will tend to take an inside looking out perspective, and they say, oh, these features would be really great for us to have, we can do all these great things with the data for us, okay? But I would also say you really need to look at it from your client's perspective. What are they getting out of this? This is the outside looking in perspective. And if you don't build value into the IoT enablement that serves your client's uh, needs and views, you run the very high risk that they may reject uh, what you are doing for your own operational benefit. Uh, they are, will be much more willing to buy into the enablement that serves your organization's needs if you're meeting your customers' needs first and, and foremost. Another aspect of this is, you know, we're, we're used to standing up our, our supply chains to support the physical uh, goods that we are manufacturing and produce. And you have uh, the supply chain operations reference model uh, where you are going to plan, source, make, deliver, and then handle service and returns. This is what we are used to doing. But when you IoT enable your products, you also need to stand up digital supply chains. Uh, this is where you're actually going to be going and creating the software, the websites, the uh, systems to actually manage retrieving uh, the data, the applications that the customers will use on their smartphone. Uh, you're going to have publication cycles where you put out the releases and the patch updates. Uh, you're going to put this up in the cloud so that it can receive and, and put the data out there, receive the data in. And another thing is it needs to be secure. You've actually got to validate and know your customer that's actually engaging in this. And this was a great chart that I, I came across that sort of looked at, well, why are companies looking to IoT enable? And a huge laundry list of things, you know, asset location, ident asset identification, inventory levels, uh, theft uh, protection, asset utilization, uh, security or surveillance. Uh, these are all great things. These are all things we want to achieve from the IoT capability. However, if you really drill into this, only three of these are about customer needs, okay? And this is basically the usual approach of taking an inside looking out perspective. If you focus too much on those other things without addressing the needs of your customers, uh, they may react negatively uh, to this. So let's think about here about IoT implementations. Uh, and this is what I call the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, 
you will talk to various technology vendors and uh, they will all have great, wonderful stories of how good this is and how great it'll be for your business. But they rarely tell you about the ones that don't go well. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, I make a point to do that. So if we think about the good, and these are good things to, to think about, okay, Uber. Uber is, at the end of the day, it's an IoT implementation. Uh, it's creating a smart application that goes on a phone, uh, that tracks the location of the driver. Uh, when you uh, are using your phone to put in a request for a driver, it sends up the GPS coordinates, it's handling all the payments. This is a wonderful thing, and, and you, you've got it here in, in great use uh, here in, in South Africa. Uh, I came across uh, this company, Ronin, which is uh, focused here in South Africa on precision farming for doing uh, yield monitoring and working with some of the major American and UPS uh, suppliers. Uh, I was really glad uh, to see these types of systems getting in, and my wife and I actually we took a, a tour of a vineyard in French Oak uh, here uh, uh, last week and uh, actually saw a farm where they were uh, actually using uh, sensors and devices to manage the, the irrigation uh, in their vineyards. Uh, uh, and that's a, a critical aspect, you know, water is, is scarce. Uh, it's always a concern. I, using IoT, here is another company that is focused. This was an Accenture uh, project that was uh, using IoT to uh, improve uh, ma better uh, resource management of, of water. Uh, and uh, your, your train system uh, here that uh, uh, major contract uh, issued in 2013, these are big industrial long-term projects that take time to implement. Uh, but I was reading through this, some of the advances of technology that are going into this are more advanced than uh, the rail system that I use to commute into New York City uh, on a regular basis. And we've had, over the past five years, several major accidents with deaths. Uh, so I was excited to see the level of, of uh, technology advancement that's going on here in this regard. Uh, uh, you've, uh, you're one of your electrical utilities is putting in smart grids, uh, smart metering uh, systems uh, to better uh, uh, manage uh, electri electricity use. Uh, I came across uh, this one here, a, a company promoting uh, anti-theft monitoring for uh, petrol uh, uh, usage, how it tracks how you actually fill up the tank uh, and it has anti-siphoning measures and, and other things. Uh, this is also another IoT deployment that's, that's happening in your midst. Uh, we took a tour of, of uh, one of the game preserves at the Kruger, and as we were out on, on the uh, one of the tours, I happened to spot uh, this, uh, this pipe, this green pipe that was actually coming up out of a termite mound. And I asked our, our, our guide uh, what that was, and he said it was actually an anti-poaching uh, sensor. So I actually got to see, I think, the system here that's being described uh, 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 actually being I implemented and, and in use. And then I also came across this other company, MTN, that is actually coming up with developer tools uh, at IoT here, a South African uh, country. So this is really interesting to see uh, this level of evolution in uh, your IT industry, that they, they've got this capability and are stepping up to be a global player in, in this. So these are all great examples of, of really good things that I, I think are very beneficial uh, and a, a demonstrative of, of how you are accomplishing. Uh, but let's take a look at, at the bad, and I, I don't know of any bad ones uh, that I can say really for, for here. Uh, most of the ones I bring up or I've come across, uh, 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 Procter & Gamble uh, puts out the Braun Oral-B uh, electric toothbrush, and, and they came up with a Bluetooth connected toothbrush and put the price out there at $50 more than uh, the standard electric toothbrush and the reviews in Amazon were just excoriating. It's like, why would I spend an extra $50 uh, to have my dentist spy on how I brush my teeth? Uh, but if, you, if they had instead just put it out there at the same price point, no price differential, customers would have bought it. 
And then they would have had the data stream coming back. And they actually had done some interesting things. They created a, a smartphone application for moms to do gamification to teach your kids how to brush their teeth. But instead, the product cratered. Okay, they missed their opportunity because they went about monetizing uh, the wrong aspect of it. Um, here's another one that I have in, in the bad category. There's a real debate going on globally about uh, do you really own your tractor anymore if you're a farmer? Uh, John Deere and, and other uh, com uh, farming equipment companies are putting out IoT enabled equipment and there's a huge debate about who owns this data. Uh, now, this was about actually John Deere wanting to protect and prevent anyone from overriding the software that actually controls the tractor. And at the end of the day, you don't want people hacking that. Okay, uh, so this was more of a PR issue here, uh, but there are other data aspects. If this tractor is IoT enabled, maybe John Deere actually knows more about the crop production at the individual farming locations. They can see across multiple farmers, what are they doing with that data? Uh, do they have a rogue employee who's saying, gee, I could use this for insider trading on commodity pricing on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange? Okay, you really need to know what are companies doing with the data, and if you do IoT implementations, being transparent uh, about the surveillance and the, and the data ownership. Uh, let's think about some really ugly ones now. Uh, okay, uh, Corky was uh, a company uh, that got stood up uh, to create a home monitoring, home automation system. Uh, they raised uh, quite a bit of money. GE put 20 million uh, invested in them, and they just went belly up. This was uh, an example of a group of people thinking, oh, gee, we, can, we know how to write smartphone applications. They didn't really go get the right proper technical resources that knew how to build the hardware and actually the control systems to do this. So it is very much about getting uh, really the, the proper developers that know how to build what's known as OT systems, operational technology systems, not information IT technology. Uh, and so this was uh, why that uh, went belly up. Now they, they have been bought out by, by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Flextronics, so uh, we may see this, this come back. Uh, here's, here's another one um, that uh, the New York City Department of Transportation uh, said, uh, gee, we've got this great idea. We've got all these cars driving around. They all have the Easy Pass toll uh, transponder in it that uh, collects, it says you just drove through, drove through this toll booth. Uh, and they said, well, we could use that same technology to monitor traffic volume in downtown Manhattan. We're not trying to collect tolls. We just want to know traffic volumes, because if we know the traffic volumes, we can control the lights better. The traffic lights reduce congestion, which will in turn reduce pollution. Great public benefit. They didn't tell anybody they were doing this. And next thing you know, some public advocacy groups said, how dare you track how I'm driving from this, from here to there. This is private information, privacy controls, uh, issues. Uh, and uh, they had to shut the whole thing down. Now, if instead the New York City DOT had stopped and said, uh, held public hearings and said, this is what we propose to do, and oh, by the way, we're not actually going to collect the device ID from the toll transponder, because uh, we don't need to know who you are. We're just trying to get a ping that a car drove past this intersection they could have uh, uh, probably got public acceptance uh, to do this. So this is, these are examples of where companies took too, or organizations too much the inside looking out view, not looking at what's the customer's benefit. And if you want to get those benefits that you think you want from an inside perspective, you first need to focus on, on the, 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 the outside customer's benefit. 
Uh, here's one, uh, one of our major telecoms, uh, Verizon. Uh, I actually think they got uh, hit with way too low a fine, 1.3 million US uh, for a super cookie. We're all used on our PCs, you use a browser and you get cookies and, and you have in the browser settings, you can go in and delete the history and, and decide whether or not you're going to accept the, the cookies or not. Well, Verizon went off and created a super cookie that was not visible to its customers and was collecting data about what websites customers were going to with their smartphones and uh, did not give uh, the customers any ability to delete these. Okay, this is really surreptitious. This is really nasty surveillance that uh, should be regulated. Uh, but again, this major public uh, loss of face, loss of trust uh, with the customers, this is where you don't want to end up with. This is why you need to take a customer perspective and, and viewpoint around this. So if we start to think about you know, what are some of the challenges of doing uh, IoT uh, here uh, in, in, in Africa? Uh, and uh, I came across this article that, uh, yeah, there's uh, some real concerns in the developing world and they actually called out that in growth markets like Brazil, India, and South Africa, about 66% of the people who responded to this uh, had real concerns about around privacy uh, and, and security. Uh, so it's even a bigger concern in uh, your country than uh, it is in the US. So, so much of the US is like, oh, yeah, I, I see the web page, accept the terms and conditions, just go on. Uh, you may not be able to get away with that here, and so you do need to take a foot forward approach in this. And, and so I've come up with an acronym which I call EDOTS. And, and this is actually the first time that I've talked ab about this uh, uh, at one of my sessions. Uh, uh, and uh, basically what I've come up with this acronym is this EDOTS to stand for the need for having explicit data ownership and transparent surveillance, okay? That is a key thing that you need to focus on that when you're gonna have an IoT enabled device that in the past wasn't, that you are going to be very explicit with your customers about what data is being collected and who owns that data. Think about a car. You don't own the data of the odometer. In fact, it's regulated. You could be fined for changing the odometer setting. That's public data that's on the vehicle. Uh, on the other hand, the engine throws off diagnostic codes that the service personnel can look at. So that is shared information that uh, it gets used across the supply chain channel. Many stakeholders can see that. Uh, but if the manufacturer says, oh, only my authorized service personnel can see it, but you're used to taking your equipment to your own uh, service uh, suppliers of choice, do your service suppliers of choice have access to uh, that data uh, or is it restricted? Uh, then there's also going to be maybe data that you have on the device. Think about the GPS system in your car. Okay, you put in an address that you want to drive to. Now your GPS in your car has a record of all the places that you ask for directions for. When you sell that car, okay, you want to be able to delete that data. You don't want to give that to the next person who owns it, or if you were leasing the car uh, and, the, and the, uh, the Ford uh, or the Toyota, you don't want them to see that information. So there's an example of where you can think about in a car, there's public information accessible to all but can't be changed, like the odometer, shared information across multiple stakeholders in the supply chain, such as for the service personnel, and then private data, which uh, you still can put on the device but have total control over uh, in this respect. So these are some of the things that you need to be thinking about uh, when you IoT enable. So EE dots is, is what I talk about here. And 
In, in Africa, there's definitely challenges. A, you've got a lot of rapid growth of your population uh, in this respect, uh, and very heavy urbanization uh, that is going on. There's going to be a lot of data generated, so there's a real need to start rapidly scaling up your infrastructure uh, to be able to handle uh, the traffic volumes, and also scaling up uh, your IT industry as well as skilling your supply chain industry to be stakeholders in this because if you just let the IT folks do this without the supply chain being involved, you can end up in some of those bad and ugly situations where, yes, it was technology worked, but you know, that your customers reacted very negatively against it, and this is where it's your responsibility to sort of step in and, and help uh, uh, drive that so it is a successful implementation for your organization. Uh, and then, uh, just to, in conclusion here, uh, this is sort of like a summary of, of uh, the things that I've observed that companies go through as they try to go through these sort of transformations. And in my workshop that I'm doing tomorrow, I'll be talking quite a bit more about this in depth. Uh, but basically, very much it is about adopting new business models, okay? Michelin will now sell you a tire as a service where you pay not for the tire, the commercial tire, but you pay uh, kilogram per kilometer transport. Uh, is, uh, so new types of business models. It's about adopting new technology. Often when you go to your IT organization and say we want to do something new and special, uh, IT says, well, we've got our standards, we want to use our existing technology. No, if you're going to go do this, this is about adopting new technology. Your IT organization has to get comfortable uh, with the new technology they're going to be asked to support. Uh, it is about learning to become a software company. Was Procter & Gamble uh, with its uh, Bluetooth-enabled toothbrush a software company before or a hardware company uh, before? No, they had to go figure out how to put on that sort of staffing and resources to go figure out how to do it. And they did great technical execution, but screwed up the business model. Uh, oftentimes, industry partnering is, is required, even uh, with uh, your competitors. This is where it's important for your organizations to join uh, the relevant industry trade associations uh, for your industry and participate in driving standards because a lot of IoT implementations uh, require uh, adoption uh, by more than just one entity. Uh, and this really can only be done effectively well through uh, industry uh, trade associations so that you don't run afoul of, of antitrust uh, type uh, stuff. Uh, and, and there's definitely a very high risk of making mistakes uh, to meet uh, customer service level expectations. Uh, as, as I've talked about in a number of things. And you may try to monetize the wrong aspects with this. Uh, and there's a, too much of a tendency to focus on direct versus indirect models. You need to plan for how is your distribution channel going to engage and be uh, a participant and a stakeholder uh, in this. Uh, and as I talked quite a bit, there's real major questions over who owns the uh, telemetry of, of the data from the IoT device. So this has a lot of challenges involving aspects around security, uh, privacy, and, and transparency, EDOTs as I call it. Uh, and then also very much uh, having a mismatch of existing skills within the organization. Uh, often you are going to have to bring in new resources with new skill sets uh, and have them learn your organizational culture uh, so that they understand what makes your company what it is and, and what its value prop is, but then can take that ethos uh, to IoT enable it uh, to, to the benefit of your customers and your own uh, business operations. And with that, I thank you, and I've got about uh, five, six minutes uh, for taking any questions.